coming up on this week's Salt and Sauce Chat Show. You saw during the first part of the pandemic, a lot of creators were going on Facebook Live or Instagram Live and doing an event and saying, put the money into me, just give him or give mm. it to charity. Because it wasn't connected to a paywall. When we went into that lockdown last year, Beatstream was the only live music streaming app in the world that had a paywall connected to it. It was always Elvis Presley. Right. From being seven, eight year old, I can remember being obsessed with Elvis. Um, and then later on, when, I mean, I, I was I basically, 50s rock and roll was the first music genre that I fell in love with via Elvis mainly. So Little Richard, Bill Early, Jerry Lee Lewis, these were the records I was collecting as a nine, 10, 11 year old kid. That was an actual reindeer's head with the bullet hole still in it. This sounds horrible now, doesn't it? But <laughs> my mum and dad, my mum and dad, we used them in a corner shopping, all of them. And my mum and dad acquired that. I don't even know where they got it from. I think somebody gave it to them. But that was on our living room wall above the, the fireplace. Because in the seventies, tacky shit like that was all right, wasn't it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Welcome along to another episode of the Salt and Sauce Chat Show. I'm David Simmons and delighted to be joined on the show tonight with musician, DJ and broadcaster. We've got Mr. Clint Boone on the show. Clint, thanks for coming on, mate. You're welcome, David. How are you doing? Are you well? Yeah, I'm not too bad, mate. How's you? How are you keeping during this whole pandemic? Yeah, good. I mean, it started off terrifying because of the financial implications of losing all my DJ work because that's my main income, you know what I mean? So in March of last year, it was quite worrying, thinking how am I going to get by without it? Because you're talking like, a lot of money that's been taken, a lot of actual bookings that have been taken away, that just got shut down. Um, unfortunately, I've still got a radio gig. I work for Excess Manchester. Yeah. I'm on, on the, I do the drive time show five days a week and a little show on a Saturday night. So that's just given us enough income just to get by on, to be honest with you. But what's happened in the, the 12 months, I've just been developing other income streams, if you like, and uh, all to do with being creative still and music related mainly. But it's actually, I'm really enjoying where I'm at now. You know what I mean? I'd, I'd rather the world hadn't gone through what it's gone through. Obviously, a lot of people are suffering and have died. But um, yeah, personally, now I, I like where I'm at and I'm excited about what's probably going to happen next, which is less of the DJ work when it comes back. I'll, I'll take less of it. Yeah. I'm doing more more making music. I'm making new music again and sharing that with the, uh, a community on Patreon. Do you know Patreon? Right. Yeah, I've heard of it before. It's like a platform where you can go on and share your music. Do you, do you find that like one of the, the positives, if you like, about the whole lockdown is that you've got more time to devote to, to developing new music now? I feel like I've been reborn, to be honest with you. And again, I, I don't want to disrespect the people that have had a, a hard time, but where, where I'm at at the moment is, you know, it's, it's the best I've felt for years, but because I'm home with my wife and my family, you know, I, I was always, I was one of these, people that was just always on my way out somewhere you know what I mean I'd be on my way out to the radio gig and then straight on a train to London to do a DJ set and then and it was just manic I was like this hamster on a wheel but with a DJ bag you know what I mean yeah and, uh, so yeah I'm enjoying I'm enjoying the um <clears throat> the enforced you know time at home and in a lot of ways it's like I've had my retirement forced on myself a bit early you know what I mean <laughs> so I'm, I'm seeing the, I'm always king of positivity i'm always you know i always look for the, the good stuff so rather than sitting around licking my wounds about losing 100 grand worth of work and you know slagging the government off i've just thought just get on with it just you know get creative be creative i've got a family to feed you know i've done i'm really proud of how i've handled the last 12 months because i have created some new income streams which have helped to replace some of the dj work but more importantly you know my, my priority now is being a musician again rather than playing other people's records on the radio yeah. clubs it's like I'm putting out new music now, one, one new track a month onto my Patreon. And it's also a great excuse to dig through. I've got boxes and boxes and boxes of like archive tapes that have never been heard, you know, stuff that I've written over the last 30 years that's never been heard or released. And it, so I'm able to share that with my Patreon followers. And then just little bits of content, you know, little like photographs of, like I found a Polaroid of like <laughs> me and Richard Ashcroft. This is at some XFM related event. Brilliant. Um, and it's the only picture of that. It's the only copy of that in the world, and it's never been published. So I can share it on Patreon and do a little story with it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So how does the Patreon work? Is it different sort of subscription levels to get different amount of content? Is that right? It's, it's for anybody who's creative. It's like, you know, comic writers use it, the novelists, playwrights, uh, designers use it, a lot of musicians, obviously. And you create it from ground up. Like, you just think, right, what have I got to offer? 
and then how much you want to charge per month. Um, so I've created for three pound a month, you get a brand new track every month. Before it's going, it's not going to come out anywhere else in the world for for a long time. It might never come out some of it. Uh, for five pound a month, you get the new track and you get something from the archives. Uh, Ten pound a month, you get the new track, the old track, and some other content. And then it's um, everybody gets invited into this Discord uh, chat that we do once a month, a Discord sort of online texting conversation that we do. And then I'll do little films of me at work on my stuff. So it's all just bits of content to engage with the the fans, you know, the community. And it's almost like back in. 30 years ago, when the Inspirals were at the peak, our peak, back then you would have had to have a record deal uh, with a distribution attached to it. You'd have had to have a fan club, you know, to communicate with your fans sort of thing. And it's like now it's all rolled into this one amazing thing called Patreon. So I'm absolutely buzzing about it. And it's it's, it's still day one, really, in terms of I only launched it in November. I've got to build it and build it. But yeah. for somebody who wants to be putting music out and getting it direct to me followers without, you know, cut out all the middlemen, do you know what I mean? There's no middlemen. It's just me and you who's subscribing at three pound a month, whatever it is. So it's dead exciting, and you can use it in different ways. Like Lloyd Cole of the Commotions, he uses it. Right. He doesn't put any music out on it. I assume he's putting his music out through a label, but he uses Patreon just to show his old memorabilia. You know, like old like song books. You know, he's written the songs or set lists or. And he's you know he's got a thousand followers, and you know that'll be quite a bit of money coming in every month, and so. You know, it's, it's it's not just for new upcoming musicians or out of work DJs. It's like there's some big names on there, like Ben Folds is using it. Ben Folds Five, do you remember him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's on there, he's massive on it. He does a lot of um, like tutorials with his piano, or oh. he'll do uh, you know like request shows. People shout a tune out and he'll play it. So you can use it in whatever way you want. If you've got a community of people that want to support you and want to follow you there's no i can't think of a more perfect platform to be doing it really so yeah i mean you mentioned there about um how he was doing um sort of requests and shout outs and stuff like that have you been doing something similar with the missus boone is it the disco rescue yeah well that's something we started we started that in week one of the first lockdown back in march of last year right and the reason that came about was for five or six years i've been helping to develop a, a, a live music streaming app called Beatstream. And we'd been creating it, like it's amazing what we'd, what we'd done. Really. We'd, we'd created it, and it was about to be launched in March of last year at the arena, the, the arena in Manchester. Yep. Uh, Blossoms were going to do a gig, and it would have been the first time where you could buy a ticket to listen to an event live if you couldn't be in the room. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's, it might be a sold-out gig at the arena, so you can't buy a ticket. Um, and then this means that you, you know if you can't be at the gig because you're in hospital, if you're in Japan, if you're in Argentina, you can still tune in live via the Beatstream app, and it's really high quality audio. And the best bit was we created it, but we'd attached a paywall to it, right. which meant that you can only listen to these events if you buy the ticket, right? So rather than you saw during the first part of the pandemic, a lot of creators were going on Facebook Live or Instagram Live and doing an event and saying put the money into me, just give him or give mm. it to charity because it wasn't connected to a paywall. When we went into that lockdown last year, Beatstream was the only live music streaming app in the world that had a paywall connected to it. Well. You can see what we'd created for a spe spe specific reason actually was just the perfect vehicle for me to be carrying on DJing through the, through the lockdowns. So every Friday night for 48 weeks, now me and my wife, Charlie, have done this it's not even a DJ set. It's a live. It's like a, a request show. People get in touch on Twitter with the, the shout outs or the requests, and we just play the tunes and we're on the mic after every song, having a laugh, getting drunk, quite edgy. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, um, it's just a, a, one of several things that we've managed to do over the last year. That's a been a lot of fun. B brought people together and entertained them, and C brought a little bit of money into the boon house. You know what I mean? So that's oh, yeah. been. A lot of fun. And we're coming up to a one-year anniversary of that, obviously. So I think there'll be a bit of a news story going around about that and, and you know, this little phenomenal thing that we've created there. That's uh, it. I mean, there's so many different things being born out of lockdown. I mean, there is a lot of positives to take about it, along with, obviously, the, the major negatives. But, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, let, let's let's get into you then a bit more, uh, Clint, if that's okay. You were born in 1959 in Oldham. Um, yeah. Growing up, mate, what, what was your sort of musical influences? Who did you sort of look at as being a teenage boy going to school thinking, do you know what, I, I want to be like him in the music industry? It was always Elvis Presley. Right. From being seven, eight-year-old, I can remember being obsessed with Elvis. 
Um, and then later on, when I mean, I, I was I basically fifties rock and roll was the first music genre that I fell in love with via Elvis mainly. So Little Richard, Bill Early, Jerry Lee Lewis, these were the records I was collecting as a nine, 10, 11 year old kid. So by the time I was getting to 12, 13, that music I was loving was pretty much a bygone era. You know what I mean? I was never going to be able to see Jerry Lee Lewis live yeah. um, or Little Richard. And then suddenly the glam, the glam rock movement in Britain, you know, courtesy of people like Boy and the Rubettes and Mud and Sweet and Gary Glitter, um, they were all doing 50s rock and roll, but in a, you know, it's like 50s rock and roll music, but with platform boots, I'm on it and sequins and makeup, but it was 50s rock and roll they were celebrating. So I found that really exciting because it was like, you know, it, it was a reference to what I, I've been loving since I was a kid. And then Shuadu Adi arrived on the scene. Remember them, Shuadu Adi? Yeah, under, under the moon of love, was it? Yeah, totally. So when that arrived, I was like, wow, this is pretty close now to what I'm, I'm digging. You know, they look like Bill Ailey and the Comets and all that. But it's still, you know, I, I, I've never really, I, I'd always had it in my head I, I could be Elvis Presley or something similar. Like kids do dream about being an astronaut. I, I dreamt about being Elvis. But I never did anything about it. I, I never really studied an instrument when I was a kid, you know what I mean? And then by, I left school in 75, went to art college in Rochdale. And then in 76, punk happened. Punk came to Manchester. And that was like, I, I was lucky enough to see the Sex Pistols when they came the second gig in Manchester in 1976. They did the famous Lesser Free Trade All gig that everybody was at, but only 40 people were actually at. I didn't go to that one. But then a few months after, they came back and did the, the Electric Circus in Manchester, which I did go to. And that was the Buzzcocks, Johnny Thunder's Heartbreakers, The Clash and The Pistols, Thursday the 9th of December, 76. And that was when it all dawned on me that, I could actually do this. I don't have to just dream about being Elvis. These are kids like me on stage here. Yeah. You know what I mean? Kids that weren't great musicians that had, you know, the same sort of things to say as I did. You know what I mean? About whether it's being angry with the government, angry with parents, or angry with anything. <laughs> just angry with everything, weren't they? Yeah. It was like, it just touched a lot of, lot of it touched, the, it ticked a lot of boxes for me, punk. And I just threw myself right into it, you know, to the extent where, I dropped out of art college. I was due to go off and do uh, a diploma or a degree, whatever you call it, a uni. And I thought, nah, don't need that now. I know what I'm doing. And I dropped out of college. I got um, a shit job in a little sheet metal factory nearby just to get some money coming in. And then started going to gigs, hanging out with bands, buying bits of musical equipment. Just really threw myself into the world of, of music, you know, as, as much as I could, you know, to say that I wasn't a musician as such, you know what I mean? I wanted to be, I think I've always been a decent singer. I've always fancied singing. Yeah. But I just started hanging out with bands and learning about everything to do with, you know, putting a gig on. And was, was was it the sheet metal company where you, you built a, a recording studio in one of their spare rooms? Is that right? N nearly. I mean, what happened there, the sheet metal job was, I was only there for probably six or seven months and it was a bit of a low point in my life, to be honest with you, because it was really hard work, hard, dirty work. And I was only 17. Dangerous, really dangerous. I was working behind the guillotine in a, Sheet oh, metal factory, and then one day a guy came in to get some steel, and he was an old friend of my mum and dad's, and he was in the furniture trade. I said, he said, I've got this uh, little company down in Ashton, eight miles away from where, where I lived. He said, Why don't you come and work for us? If you're not up here, come and work for me. So I went working for Mike in Ashton. The company was called Solar Design back then, um, and within a few months, his partner pulled out, his part, his business partner pulled out of the business, and Mike came straight to me and said. How would you fancy buying shares in the company and coming in as a director? So oh. I was only 20, 21 at this point. And I had no money, so I borrowed some money off my mum and dad. I got a bank loan, put a few thousand quid into the company and became a company director at age 21. Wow. And the company expanded fairly quickly because we were doing some really cool stuff. And um, so it meant that by probably 82, 83, we had a bigger premises and there was a lot of old offices in the, in the, the factory that weren't being used for anything. And I just took over them and made it into a little recording studio and rehearsal complex. It was only three rooms or something, but it meant that I could start, you know, these, these bands that I was hanging around with and helping out, I could record the demos for them just onto four track cassette, four track cassette machine. And bands could rehearse in there for cheap. So I created this little base for the local bands. That was from like 83, 84 onwards. And then towards the end of 85, I got a call from, a, a chap in Oldham saying, I've got this band, we want to come and do 
a demo, you want, want you to record some tunes for us. And I said, right, no problem. Monday night, come down. What's your name? He said, in Spiral Carpets. Um, and they came down and it was like a four-piece band at this point. Really raw, punky. And there was something about that I loved because, I'd, you know, I'd love the punk vibe of it. But I'd always like 60s garage music as well. Right. So I was listening to bands like The Seeds and the 13th Floor Elevators and Question Mark and the Mysterians and the Chocolate Watch Band. This was what I was into at that point. And um, the, the Inspirals came, I think I did two demo sessions with them before I joined. And after the second one, I went away on holiday with my girlfriend at the time. I, went to, I don't know where we went, Spain or something. Uh, but I was listening to this, this recording that I'd done of this band, the Inspirals, and I just became obsessed with it because I, I realised that if we put an electric organ into that, which I've got the electric organ because I've been collecting all, all sorts of shit, <laughs> it'll sound like the seeds or it'll sound like the Velvet Underground. You know what I mean? It's like they're, they're like a quality garage band with, without that that keyboard, and I've got that. And I have the Urquhart, obviously, as well. <laughs> so I just said to Graham one, one night when I got back from Hollywood, look, how about we try bringing the organ in? I'll jam along and see how it sounds. And um, we got the organ in the room one night, started playing it, which was, that was it. Just, you could tell right away the sound was just... Nobody else in the north of England that we knew was doing anything like it. Yeah. I don't think anybody else in Britain was doing it. Um, and what, what we had was our, our drummer, Craig, who was only 14 when he joined the band, and then I joined a few months after. But he was really into the new music, like the hip-hop and the house music. He was really into all that. So his beats were really contemporary. Uh, and the way he looked was, well, if you see him on the early pictures, he looks like uh, you know he, he, he looked like he could have been doing break dancing in the middle of Manchester on a piece of lino on a Saturday afternoon. In fact, he did a bit of that. <laughs> so we had this, we had this, and I was twelve years older than Craig. I mean, Craig passed away four years ago, obviously. You know, yeah. God rest his soul. But yeah, um, that age difference actually turned out to be an advantage because I was I was old enough to not be a knobhead, and I'd been through industry. You know, I'd been the company director, so I, I valued this the fact that this band was starting to accelerate and get you know traction. So I was like the older head. Graham was as well to a large extent. Graham, the guitarist, he pretty much started the band back in eighty three or eighty four. So we were like the, the older brains that sort of had a bit of a business idea. We had a big knowledge of the the music of the past. You know, the psychedelic stuff particularly. You know, Graham was equally into all the psychedelic stuff. But Craig, this young lad, he was banging to like us could do and things like that. So it meant that we were we were, we were as, as much contemporary as we were retro. Now, I remember a lot of bands around that 86, 87 period. There was a lot of bands treading similar paths to us, but they were very, very retro. Like, do you remember a band called Birdland? Not off the top of my head, mate, no. Sorry, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. They had um, there's four of them. They all had ball heads, but blonde ball heads. Right. They looked brilliant. They dressed brilliant. Yeah. But it was, it was a 60s revival band, do you know what I mean? In, in all, to all intents and purposes. It wasn't really, it didn't have a contemporary edge. And at the time, I didn't see that. I can just see that why, why we broke through and Birdland didn't. Um, and some of these other bands that were, you know, Doctor and the Medics, they were, they were like, they were like such a retro vibe, weren't they? Yeah. And crazy Ed. Can't remember. Crazy Ed were a bit more rocky, but what I'm saying, we were, to a lot of people in, in the older Murray, it was just like these throwbacks to the 60s, but we had that cutting edge, you know, that meant that when our records started getting played alongside the Happy Mondays a couple of years later and the Roses and James, we sounded as contemporary as any of them, but we still yeah. had that nice psychedelic pop edge, you know what I mean? So it was uh, it was nice that that first few years when it started, everything seemed to accelerate a bit more every week and we get bigger and bigger. And, and then, boy, you know, John Peel picked us up and that was it. We were just... Um, there's no stopping us then because everything accelerated overnight, you know what I mean? Yeah. How did you adjust to those new experiences and what I mean by that, like performing in front of bigger crowds, like bigger tours, like travelling all around the world, I mean, with, with the band? How did you adapt to that? I mean, like you said, there was a big age difference between yourself and other band members. Did you have to play like a bit of a father figure and keep them in check or were you just as bad as others? I was the worst. <laughs> <laughs> they were looking after you? Yeah, no, there was, oh, yeah, I mean, it was all, yeah, I mean, I had my moments, but Generally, I think, you know what, the, the key to it was going through all those incredible moments, but with your mates, stops it being scurry. Mm. I imagine that, that same journey would have been me as a solo artist. I'd have probably cracked up by 1988-89 and sacked off because it, it would have been a lot to take on board here, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but yeah, doing it with your mates, you know, flying to Japan for the first time, with your mates because you've got a hit record out there it's like 
you know what I mean? Just I think having that gang was it just made it a lot easier to um to to um you know to cope with mentally and there was always somebody there to bring you down. If you started getting a bit big for your boots, you know what I mean? You started acting a bit too much of a pop star. There'd always be some drummer somewhere behind you smacking you on head and say, sort your neck out you'd have to all get. You know what I mean? So it was, uh, I think it being in a, a you know a group made it a lot easier to um you know to live with what was happening. It was an amazing it was an amazing time and it happened really, you know, nice big steps forward and yeah, really, really good. I think we did good. I, you know, we, we never got as big as Oasis or the Roses or whatever, but I like our contribution. I, I like our the journey that I've had through it. Yeah. I won't really change any of it. You know, it's like I, I don't look back with regret on any of it, really. Um, you know, it's, it's all, I'm proud of what we did. And I mean, the history has been very kind to us. I say that to a lot of people these days. That Back then, there was always a bit of, you know, in the press, oh, in Spiral Carpets, not as cool as the Happy Mondays and, you know, not as... You know, don't do as many drugs as such a body. But um, like now, it's history is just hundred percent nice to us. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you mentioned you, you mentioned two bands here. Sorry, one was Oasis. I mean, it's it's quite a well known fact that uh, Noel Gallagher was once a roadie for the Inspiral Carpets. Is that right? Yeah, it was more than a roadie actually. I mean, he, he auditioned to be our singer when Steve left in um, towards the end of '88. Stephen Holt left. He rejoined the band many years later, as you probably know. But Noel, Noel was the um, the first person to audition to be our singer. Right. He because um, he was a fan of our, he was a friend of ours and a fan of the band. So when he heard that Steve had left, he was the first one that said, "I want kind of an, an audition." And um, he came in and we did the audition. And I mean, we liked him as a bloke; we loved him, but we didn't think his voice suited what we were doing because Steve, who just left the band, had a massive voice. Yeah, and Noel didn't, and he still doesn't. He don't, he has. He has a great voice, but he's not hes not like operatic. And Steve was, you know, really belting out. And ultimately, Tom Ingler was the best singer we could have possibly got because he took that bat on and went with it, you know what I mean? Uh, but yeah, we took Noel on. We said, look, we need a roadie, but we need somebody to open the office every day. Uh, we took him on board full time. He was with us every day for the next almost four years, I believe it was. Um, so if we had a meeting with an accountant, we'd take him with us. If we went seeing a record company to try and get a deal, he'd come with us. We took him everywhere and... I think that's how he he learned quite a lot about the industry. Which so he, the, he served his apprentice with you guys then, really, didn't he? It's fair to say that, and he, he'd tell you that as well. He does. He's very he's very complimentary about those years working with us. He, he says it's. He's, I've actually heard him say it, it was the, the best time, the happiest time of his career, because he got paid well. It was always um, you know he could always get stuff that he needed. <laughs> And I'm not on about guitar strings. But, um, <laughs> it was all, it just had a great little uh, existence. And, you know, we loved him. He, he loved us at the time. And um, he didn't get any any headaches. Whereas with Oasis, from day one, it was, you can imagine, the weight on his shoulders. You know what I mean? Not just from the, the publicity and being under that massive magnifying glass, but also having Liam winding him up every two minutes and all that. So, and that's why he says, you know, working with Inspirals was the happiest time of his career because he was, he was happy. Do you remember the first time you heard an Oasis track with him lead singing on it? Yeah, you know what? I do, and I, di I didn't realise it was him. Um, and I, I I, I should know the name of the song, but I think it was a B-side on one of the, like maybe the second single. Right. You know, are you an expert on Oasis tracks? This is, Live Forever was quite an early one. Um, Live Forever. Well, the B-side was a quite slow, bluesy track. And I remember listening to it thinking, who the fuck's that? <laughs> and I thought, they got, it sounded like they got some blokes singing with it. And, and Anyway, it turned out it was Noel doing one of the B-sides, um, and I should—I feel bad that I don't know the name of the song, but that would be the first time I heard him singing, you know. Um, but then ultimately, yeah, when he started doing the, the bigger, the big lead vocals, you know, like Donald back in anger and all that, just, he can do it, you know what I mean? He's, he's, uh, he's, um, he's a master of his craft, and he? As a songwriter and as a performer. Um, but I, I love, somebody asked me the other day in an interview, who do you love most, Noel or Liam? They actually asked that question, and I said, I love them both equally, but in completely different ways. Because we know him for you know for years, we, we shared a bed. There's pictures of me and, him, me and him in bed together. You know what I mean? Like when we were slumming it in the early days, and we'd have we'd all be sharing a hotel room or whatever, and we'd all be there in bed. Hey! <laughs> so, and you know, we, we saw the world together for the first time. You know, me, the rest of the Inspirals, and Noel Gallagher. You know, we toured America together for the first. We were all together. Those young lads were. You know, from very working class backgrounds, then suddenly we're on 
in a limousine in LA going to, you know, meet uh, David Geffen or something. It's like, you can't go through stuff like that and not love that person forever, really. Um, and with Liam, I mean, I always, like back in the day before Liam started with Oasis, he was always a very gentle soul. And I've always known he was that. All through the Oasis years, you never really saw that because he didn't really get a chance to get a word in. And if he did, it was usually the word fuck, wasn't it? So when Noel was getting all the, you know, he was always perceived as being the intelligent one back then and the, the one with the mouse, which he is. But Liam always got a bit of a bit short changed, I thought, back in the day. And it's only in the last few years where you can see what a good soul he is. You know what I mean? The way he's handling himself publicly, the way he's on Twitter, you know, he's, he's funny. Um, his timing's impeccable when he's putting tweets out and all that. And I do, I do know him. I mean, I know them both. And if anything, I see more of Liam and I'm in, more in contact with Liam these days. But I love Liam for how he's turned out and how the fact that the world can now see the the real Liam Gallagher that we, you know, some of us knew that was there all the time. You know, a lovely young lad who goes to see his mum at every opportunity. Yeah. So yeah, I love them both. And and then there's Paul. Don't forget Paul, the other brother. I mean, yeah. I'm close to Paul as well. And they're all, uh, you know. When I met them all for the first time, they were, they weren't what they are now. They weren't any any sort of figureheads or anything. They're just three working class lads from Burnage who'd had a pretty tough upbringing. You know what I mean? And and that was it. They were part of our family from back then. So it's been nice to be part of that journey um, to where we are today. And you know, it's, it's, it's surreal at times, isn't it? Yeah, no, that's superb, mate. Back to the spiral carpets. I mean, you were at the forefront of the, the Manchester scene, if you like. Um, you grew up in Oldham, which was eight miles away from Manchester. Tell us about the whole Manchester era. What, what was going on through that? What sort of other bands were involved in that as well? It was funny how it came about because we were grafting away in Oldham, doing our little hybrid sort of psychedelic pop music or garage pop. Elsewhere, you know, before we even met the Happy Mondays, you know, they were in Little Hudson or whatever, and they, they were doing their hybrid of, like, funk and punk, you know, blended together. The Roses, who I did know from early on, um, you know, they were doing almost, they were doing like, this was like Simon and Garfunkel with psychedelia and, you know, funky beats and that. So we were all, I think we were all just mixing up our styles, you know what I mean, and, and mixing up our influences without really seeing what each other was doing. And then when it started coming above ground, there was um, a thread through it all. And it wasn't the, the thread of, we all sounded the same. It was that thread of experimentation and not just copying off the, you know, the latest indie bands, because there was a big indie music scene, wasn't there, in the mid eighties in, you know, the old shoegaze thing and all that. Uh, and the Smiths had been big, but, None of us were emulating anybody in particular, I don't think. Uh, and we, like, you know, where we had that 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 mix of old psychedelic tunes and Craig's contemporary, you know, love of house music, which was brand new at the time. You know, the Mondays had that equal, they were equal parts, Joy Division and, uh, you know, Funkadelic. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think that's what, that's why what we brought to, to that scene, th those three or four bands, you know, the Roses, Mondays, us, James, um, we brought this colour to the scene and it wasn't just this, the sonic colour, it was the way we dressed as well because we all dressed like, you know what I mean? We, we, the we baggy like, jeans and stuff. When you look back now, we were bloody Herberts, weren't we? It's like times against fashion, but I, I, I don't regret one thing that I wore and I don't regret that her style at all. And I'd, I'd had that her cut from the ball head. I first had my her cut like, in 1984. I went for a pure ball head. And for, <laughs> for two or three years, nobody else in town had that apart from girls. Right, it was like John Alumni had it for Purdy on the New Avengers. One of the a couple of the Ramones had had it. Brian Jones had the Rolling Stones, but it wasn't. You know, modern kids in Manchester weren't doing it, and I was getting a lot of shit everywhere. I went for a couple of years. I was getting called all kinds of names. You know what I mean? Um, and I was always just like, you know, water off a duck's back. Don't worry. About it. I think I used to do it to get attention. I used to wear white jeans all the time, right. just because I knew that it wound people up. Because what they're not practical. You know what I mean? And I used to just do anything I could to not be abrasive, but to get, get you know, get the rise out of somebody. Whereas now I'm happy to fade in a bit, you know what I mean? I've got a more sensible haircut and I do, I do wear blue jeans now. And, you know, I remember a time when I just thought wearing a black T-shirt and blue jeans was like, that's, how can you, you know, you just, you're letting the human race down. You know, that's what I felt about like navy blue and that back then. But um, 
so I've calmed down a bit now. But yeah, I think the colour, the, the, you know, one of my ma lasting impressions of what happened with Manchester will always be the colour and, the, you know, the colour in the music, the colour in the visuals and, the, the, you know, the the, 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 the stories, the, the, you know, the, the times we spent together. Whereas some music scenes have got real dark shadow, like grunge. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was a great yeah. you know, music scene, but it's quite dour when you think about it, isn't it? And, and there was obviously death with, you know, with Kurt Cobain and that, but... You know, it's, and like the scar thing was brilliant, but it is it? You know, a lot of a lot of politics with it, and uh, but Manchester, you just instantly think a lot of people off the tits and a lot of colour. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean one one thing you mentioned there, Clinton, is that you knew the Stone Roses from your early days. You mean you played a big part in, in Manny joining the Stone Roses, didn't you? Yeah, sort of. But I mean, he he already knew them because he'd actually played with them um, in a different band. They were called the Waterfront, I think, early on. That would be 80, 1983, 84, maybe. Me and Manny had a band called The Mill with a guy, a guy called Chris Goodwin on drums. So this was from 80, late 83 through through 84 and into 85. We had a band called The Mill. We never did any gigs. We just recorded every weekend. I've still got all the recordings here. Um, and that when that came to an end, it was because um, Manny went to work in um, the Opera House, I think it was in Manchester, doing lights. He got a gig doing the lights. I went off and joined the Inspirals. Chris Goodwin went off and started a band called The High that did really well as well. Um, so Manny was working in this lighting job. You know, he, he pretty much hung his bass up and his guitar. He, he wasn't really that interested. And some of the lads out of the waterfront went on to form um, the Stone Roses. So they were on the scene. But then uh, the bass player, um, Pete Garner, left the band. And I'm not sure what year this would have been, but I'm guessing 80, 80, 88 maybe. And we went in the boardwalk one Friday night, me and Graham, just to watch a band, have a drink or whatever. And uh, Ian Brown and John Squire were sat at the table looking a bit a bit glum. And we got talking and they said, our bass player's left or leaving. Uh, do you know anybody? And I said, well, our, our bass guitarist at the time was Scott Curry in the Inspirals. Yeah. He went on to join Paris Angels, I think, didn't he? Yeah, he did. So Scott, I knew for a fact, if he'd have heard that the Roses needed a bass player, he would have left us and got in there. You know, and I, I couldn't really blame him. But So I said, anyway, I'm not, not going to tell Scott because we need him. But I said, I'll keep my ears open and just, uh, if, I, you know, if I think of anybody, I'll let you know. Next day, Saturday, it was in Manchester, walking through the Northern Quarter, and I saw a man, his brother, Greg, and I just thought, you know, Manny, you know, and I said to him, look, the Roses are looking for a bass player. Let Manny know because, it, it you know, it's, it's for him, isn't it? And anyway, so by the end of the weekend, he'd, he'd got the gig, he was in there. So, because Manny didn't realise what was going on. He didn't, I don't think he knew that Pete Garner was leaving or whatever. So it was only, I think, in, in, they probably would have thought about him at some point. Let's ring Manny up. Well, yeah, I think I got the, uh, I got the credit for that. So I'm having it. <laughs> quite right, mate. I mean, you've actually played quite a part. You're quite the, the talent spot, if you like. And correct me if I've got any of this wrong, um, Clint. But Guy Garvey from Elbow, you played a part in pulling him through. Alfie Bo as well, who's the, the, the operatic singer. Um, uh, did you have a part to play in their rise to fame? Yeah, well, I helped. The one with Elbow was, I was involved with a band called Mantra Luna. I was recording them uh, and not managing them, but helping them out. Because at this point, I had the Inspiral success. The Inspirals had knocked it on the head for a few years. I had the Clint experience that was doing really well. So I was also looking after or working with Mantra Luna, who were a great band. And I got a call from Phil Chadwick, who I'd only met him, I think when the Inspirals were working years before at a studio in Manchester. Phil was the tea boy. So he phoned me up, introduced himself, so you might remember me, I worked with it at Square One. The other tea boy was Damon Goff. They've done all right, aren't they? Because one now managed the elbow and the other one's badly drawn by. So he said, I, you know, um, we've got a gig up in... Oh, no, I had a gig. Mantra Luna had got a gig in the city in Glasgow, I think it was. Right. And I think Phil said, can my band come and play on the same bill as you lot? And they were called Soft at the time. And he said, but we're, we're, we're thinking of changing our name to Elbow. Um, anyway, so we did this gig. Me and Phil got on like an house on fire, started staying in touch. Um, an elbow at the time were looking for a record deal. They'd not put any records out. And I think they got what they used to call some demo money. Do you remember that? <laughs> you got, oh, I've got a grand off RCA for a demo money. And you'd go and record in a studio, record your songs, and you'd send them off 
to the A and R man at RCA who paid yeah. for it, and then he might say, "No, you're a bit shit," or "Yeah, we're having you." So they got offered uh, seven hundred and fifty quid off. I've got to get my labels right. Here. I think it's Chrysalis. Yeah. So Phil phoned me up. He said, "Right, we've got some demo money off Chrysalis." I said, "How much you get? Seven hundred and fifty quid." I said, "Right, keep it. Buy the band some gear with it." And I'll record the band's demo on my equipment because I had quite a nice home studio set up at the time. So we went into the Roadhouse in Manchester one Saturday afternoon to record the drums and bass because some of the lads out of Elbow worked behind the bar there. So we had access to it. Recorded the drums and bass there. And then we got the rest of it recorded in my little loft studio in uh, Rochdale, like a proper little in the attic of my roof. Had a little studio that I recorded, <laughs> built. And then um, we got the, the we got, um, guy up there to do the vocals uh craig came and did the keyboards and stuff uh, mark did the guitar up there remember rightly and it was just that that was it was the first ever recordings that elbow had done and they did two songs newborn and any day now and if you heard the the, the if you heard the recordings today they are beautiful you could tell it's like they're not too much different than what they actually put out apart from guy's voice is quite a lot higher and when i played i played guy the recordings a couple of years ago um and he was like I can't believe how high my voice is. Like, really? I'll be the cops in your mouth. <laughs> um, it was, uh, well, yeah, so that was what I did with Elbow, give them a leg up there. But And they got the deal. But I'll tell you what they did. The guy from Chrysalis that had given the money, I'm sure it's Chrysalis, he was away on holiday. So in the meantime, Phil, the manager, played that tape to another record label that signed them up. And I think wow. that might be Virgin. So they got a major deal. The next thing I did with them was we rented a van, a big two of us, and I drove them out to France um, because they decided they were going to write the album and demo it in France. In uh, one of the lads in the band, the, his parents had a, a villa out there somewhere. So I drove them to France, dropped them all off, came back. They were due to be out there for like three months, I think. And then after two weeks, I got a call from Phil saying, right, you, we need to go back to France. They've all fallen out. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> So I went back down. I think I think they just, I don't I think they might have had a bit of a bit of fraction as we used to say in Oldham, but I think it's more a case of it wasn't being very productive for them, so they decided to come home. So I went and brought them back. Um and since then I've just we've always we're still, you know, there's a lot of love between us, me me and the elbow camp. Um it was on Alfie Bo, that was a story. That's a very surreal on that. So about ninety-five, the Inspirals is split in spring of ninety-five. And I was still making new music, and I was I was making music that I think my, my manifesto was record stuff that you couldn't have done with the Inspirals. Do you know what I'm saying? Because yeah, it, it, I'd done that. We'd done the garage pop, so I, just, I sort of came in with the idea that I can do anything now. There's no boundaries here. So, and um, I had a conversation with a woman who worked for BMG Publishing, uh, Caroline, who was a great friend of mine. And I said, "Look, I'm, I'm getting into doing." some unusual stuff music wise if, if you come across anybody that might want to collaborate anything unusual let me know and she called me up a few days after and said right my husband who was a, i think he was a builder at the time has just bumped into this um this kid in fleetwood who's a really good opera singer and he's looking to do stuff and my name had come up in the conversation he'd be like, he said yeah that'd be great i could meet clint so we got in touch on the phone. Now, bearing in mind at this point, Alfie Bo had never recorded anything. He'd not studied to be an opera singer. He'd learned it off listening to his dad's opera records at home. And at the time, he was working at TVR in Fleetwood spraying cars. He was a car a body sprayer. Right. And he'd, he was singing at work. He'd be doing, he'd be spraying his car. And singing like, like workmen do, but he's always opera with him. And I think the story goes at one time, this guy came into the, the, the body shop for something and he was involved with the Doyle Cart opera. And this guy heard Alfie singing and said, you know, you've got real skill there and the real, you know, something that's worth pursuing. And he'd never thought about it at that point. But then, so when I met him, he was about to go and work with the Doyle Cart opera, which was like a touring opera company, but I think that's the, the idea. Right. So anyway, I talked on the phone at length and, and I, I explained what I was doing. I'm making this psychedelic, re really spacey music, you know, but I want, let's try some opera vocals on it. So he got the train over to Rochdale. I picked him up at the station, drove him back to our house, got him up the ladder into my attic and started playing in these songs. And he, he's singing along. And I'm just getting as much audio recorded as I could because it was just incredible. Like, you know, even then, the power. Yeah. 
the next thing, we were doing gigs and he was coming out on the road with us doing uh, what gigs he could. I mean, by this point, he was moving to London to do uh, to join the opera school okay. to study it for the first time. Uh, so he couldn't do every gig with the band. He did occasional gigs with us. Um, and then eventually the band disbanded for one reason or another. We didn't fall out. We just stopped doing it. I'll tell you what happened. I got distracted by being a radio presenter and a club DJ. That was around the, 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 2000, that was, wasn't it? But that's why the Clint Boone experience stopped pretty much because I got accidentally became a radio presenter. <laughs> so, but yeah, the, the Alfie story, we're still in touch. And last time I spoke to him, he's well up for doing more music. So going back to the conversation, the beginning of the conversation, the idea of doing Patreon and music, the amount of collaborations I can do now because I've got an outlet for it. Yeah. I've got the contacts. You know, Paul Weller's a, a mate of mine. And he's often said he wants to collaborate on, on something. I could do more work with Alfie Bo. Arthur Baker's keen to do something else with me. So it's really um it's really nice that those those previous chapters that were quite surreal. I'm probably going to be revisiting some of them, you know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll end up doing something with Noel or, or Liam. Me and Super. Noel, when Noel was working with the Inspirers, we often talked about beyond this, let's do something together. You know, that was a conversation that we had more than once about me and him and whoever doing something else after the Inspirals. Do you think that'll ever come to fruition, do you think? I don't even know if Noel would be I'd certainly, I'd, I'd love it if he was, but I think Liam would. I think Liam would do something. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure that, I mean, Liam's really, you know, open about the fact that these days he, he's not writing his own songs. He's getting co-writers to help him, uh, which is great. I mean, it's great that he's doing that and it's great that he's, he's honest about it and not embarrassed about it because it's like, yeah. there's no wrong with that. Elvis Presley didn't write songs. You know what I mean? And he was the king. They don't call him the king for nothing. But, um, but so yeah, I mean, you know, maybe I'll try and write something for Liam and see what you know what he thinks. And that that might sound really grand, but um, Simon Aldred out of Cherry Ghost, he, he's writing for Liam now. I'm yeah. writing with him, so it's doable. You know what I mean? It's like just making the connections. Yeah, well, I mean, you you touched on how the spiral say the split up in 1995. You went on and done the Clinton Boone experience. Um, Back in 2002, the band got back together. Um, they rejoined. They did two sellout tours in 2002 and 2003. How was it getting the guys back together and, and going out and doing those tours at that point? It was beautiful. I remember it because for, for years, with the Clint Brown experience, I had no desire to revisit the Inspirals thing. For whatever reason, it was like I just didn't. I think it's because I was so into that. Having that blank canvas with the Clint Boone experience where I could do whatever I wanted, you know, no matter how stupid it was. Like when I went on the um, TFI Friday to do White Nose Sugar, yeah. which was at the end of 2000. It was I'm, I'm, of sw I'm smiling here because I remember it because you had two different microphones, didn't you? Yeah, and I yeah, remember, yeah. that's how I remember it. I just thought it was, yeah, but do you not remember the Reindeer Z on the front of me? <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. I, that was an actual Reindeer Z with the bullet hole still in it. This sounds horrible now, doesn't it? But... <laughs> My mum and dad, my mum and dad, we used to live in a corner shop in Oldham, and my mum and dad acquired that. I don't even know where they got it from. I think somebody gave it to them. But that was on our living room wall above the, the fireplace. Because in the 70s, tacky shit like that was all right, wasn't it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So anyway, it, they ended up giving it. My mum said that at one point, I, I need to get rid of this. Can you? And I'm like, I could use it on stage with my band. So putting that on the front of the organ, I couldn't have done that in the spirals because A, it would have been disrespectful to what we were all about. Mm. And B, the drummer would have twatted me across back at Ed. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, so, yeah, so I had, with the Clint Boone experience, the stage was like, it was just like nobody else in Britain was doing anything like it. You know, there was the, the reindeer's head, there was furry lights around its horns. We had a cardboard cut out of me, life size at the side of me. We had a guy playing tuba, a uh, tuba kid. Uh, he, he'd do a tuba solo while, while I poured a full pint of lager down the, the tuba. It was all, it's just like cabaret, you know what I mean? With great music and an opera singer. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It was just bizarre. But at the time, I remember people always loving it because they used to say, nobody else is doing a show like this in Britain. Nobody else is doing anything like it. You know what I mean? At that, like at the end of the nineties, up to 2000. Um, and that, that was, you know, that, that was beautiful. But when that ended, because I started getting back into radio and uh, DJing and stuff, there was still a couple of years where I wasn't really intending on doing the Inspirals again. And I think for me personally, when I met me, me now wife, because I've been married once before, but me and Charlie met around that time, early 2000s, 2001. 
And I remember being at my mum's one time and my mum was getting all the VHS tapes out and showing Charlie my old TV appearances on Top of the Pops and stuff. Because Charlie missed out on that. She was quite a lot younger than me and she didn't remember, you know, she, I think when we headlined the Reading Festival, I think she was having her eighth birthday party. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we were, we were laughing about that. But anyway, so we watched this video my mum put on and it was in Spirals on the Word doing Saturn Five, which would have been probably 1994, 93, 94. And it was a live performance, and it was when you saw all the dancers going for it and psychedelic lights behind us. And I remember watching it and just thinking, I'm ready to do that again now. You know what I mean? That's and it was I, I at the time I was being managed by a guy called Richard Jones, who, you know, he's still a big manager, he manages the Pixies now and a lot of other big bands. But I just said to him, I said, Richard, I think I'm ready to put the put the question to the band about maybe doing something. And we started a few little discussions with the band and, you know, first talking about there's some back catalogue related issues that we needed to deal with in terms of like, you know, publishing or whatever. And at one of these meetings, I just said, right, the, who fancies doing it again? And it was like, yeah, let's do it. And it was, it was brilliant because that, that just really, I, I we all knew that we were, we were just, we were opening up this, this Pandora's box of, of something beautiful that people loved and wanted and, and it was um, it was a nice period that you know getting ready for that was really exciting. It was it was interesting as well because a lot of the equipment that I had had become obsolete. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the, my stage setup in 1990 was this amazing. Oh, it's just beautiful. It's like a it's just like a. I just got all the best gear I could get for for on stage, and it was like you know samplers and weird machines that did this, that, and the other. And but by 2003, whenever it was, when we got back. A lot of the machines were obsolete, so they're hard to work with and they're unreliable. So I had all that to sort out the technical side of things. But then the other thing that I found was that a lot of the songs that I'd written back in the day, I pl played with the Inspirals. I couldn't remember how to play them right. because I was never, I've, I've never been a trained keyboard player. I can't read music, you know. It's like, and a lot of the songs, even a song like Joe that I wrote, I wrote that song. I wrote the words, I wrote the music, and I couldn't remember. Ding, 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 ding. I couldn't remember where, where my fingers went. I had a friend up in Newcastle. This was in the news at the time, actually. Michael Porter, who's now the keyboard player in uh, Smooth and Terrell. The one with the ball head and the far fees, are funny enough. <laughs> he became a pen pal of mine back in, um, at the end of the 80s. He was a big fan from Newcastle. And we used to write to each other. And we became friends later on. But he, he learned to play keyboards by, amongst other people. He, he copied my keyboard parts off records. <laughs> And a lot of those keyboard parts, to be honest with you, it wasn't just me playing it once. It was they had overdubs on it, so things that were actually impossible to play in real time. Yeah. And he he learned he could do it all. He's he wow. an incredible musician, this lad. So anyway, I found myself in two thousand and three, phoning him up, saying, "Hey, Mike, it's Clint. Um, you know that song that I wrote, Joe? What are the chords on it?" And he talked me through it on the phone. I'd be doing my biro right down, right? So all right, yeah, yeah. And then what? And, and then the middle eight. What's the middle eight? You know what I mean? It was like that. So it's like. I had the technical issue to sort out and then remembering up here what I needed to be doing with my fingers. And then we took it out on the road. And I think the first gig, I'm pretty sure it was the Octagon in Sheffield. And I remember the band, like we were in the dressing room and then it was like, right, lads, time to come, come on, time to go on. And we sort of stood on the stage, but behind the, the, black, the back, background, what they call it, the backdrop. Yeah. And a big picture of a cow on it, big, like, moving animated cow. And you could hear the crowd going, <laughs> and then the coming on music outside. And I remember just getting the, the biggest goosebumps probably I've ever had in my life. You know, just like, whoa, fucking hell, you know what I mean? Just incredible. And it was only, I mean, the Octum wasn't the biggest gig in the world, but that moment was like, we're back, you know, you know what I mean? We're back and the audience are back as well, more important. Yeah. Them. So, so we, had, we had great times after that, you know, great times again. And, you know, started, um, you know, and enjoying it, enjoying being in a band with your mates again and all that stuff that we've not done for a while. So what is the status of, of the band? Are you still together? Are you split up? You're on a, you're on a break? What's the, is there a yeah, possible we're, another we're, comeback? We're very much together as in we're, we're a business. So every week there's, there's conversations, you know, there's emails every week about music. Um, you know, we want to, can we feature one of your records on? No, that's why I call Dad Rock or whatever. But um, there's always that going on. In terms of the live thing, we've just, none of us, you know, whenever it comes up, none of us are ready to do it without Craig yet. And, you know, because yeah. Craig was, he was that young lad. He was behind us for 30 years and it's hard to just switch that for somebody else. Um, mm. So I think there's, there's that, you know, it's like, to me, with the Inspirals, we had a great, we've had a great journey 
And if there was ever the right time to stop, it probably was after Craig died. You know what I mean? But, but you know, but that's not the band's. Um, that's not our statement. That's like me saying, I, I'm, I'm not feeling it yet. But I think one day we'll probably do something together. Um, there'll come a moment that'll be like, this is the perfect time to do it. You know what I mean? Uh, and I've said to a lot of people that if I think if we were doing it full time when he passed away, you know, if we were a full time band and if we did have a big entourage of people that relied on that wage, we might have carried on sooner, um, you know, with, with somebody else drumming, but we didn't need to. We all, we've all got other jobs. Um, and I think we're all of the same opinion that the Inspirals was, we did something monumental. And then by coming back and doing it again, that, that was monumental. And by having, you know, the last album we did was phenomenal. In 2015, we put an album out. It was just, I think, the best work we've ever done. We got John Cooper Clark on a track. And it was just like, you know, why why carry it on now? Maybe that's where we should finish it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But we'll see. I do, I do believe that there'll be something. And it's nice that we're, we're in touch with Tom, you know, even though Tom left the band and... There was a little bit of acrimony at the time and a bit of, you know, stupid stuff said in the press and that, but we're still in touch, you know, and it's like, you know, maybe one day we can do something that involves all mm -hmm. members of the Inspirals, you know what I mean? Like you said, there might come a date when you, it just feels right when you get the guys back together. Yeah, you know what, it's, it, I think at the moment, because we're all, I'm, well, I said we're all, I'm not sure what they're all doing at the moment, I'm not supposed to for a few weeks, but it, it's like I've, I've got my own, um, you know, my own ambitions of what I want to do next. And regardless of that, my day to day is absolutely crazy with the amount of animals that we've got to deal with and DIY shit that needs sorting out, and and then just general, you know, accountancy and bang and all this bollock. So it's like it's almost like if somebody said no, but like if I got the call now, don't I get any sparrows back together? Be like, I can't. I'm a bit busy really. I've got me my dog's poor, and my dog's on antibiotics. There's a rabbit out there that needs bathing because it's full of its own shit, and so I probably leave it for this week, Graham. <laughs> But, um, no, it's one of them. I still love what we've created, and it's still, it's still there for us to revisit it, mm. you know, untainted. But you know, when, when if, if and when we want to, so yeah. let's see what happens there. But it'd be nice yeah. to see into the future, wouldn't it, and just see if, if it does happen or not. Yeah, I mean, one thing you touched on earlier as well is uh, your movement from being in the bands to to actually being a radio presenter. How did that move come about? How did you make the move into the radio industry? That's a, a good question because. I never liked the sound of my own voice, believe it or not. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I remember hearing my voice for the first time when I was probably nine or ten when I got my first cassette recorder, which would be, I think it's like 69, probably maybe maybe 70. And I got it for Christmas, this uh, cassette machine. And I, the first thing you do is talk into the mic. Hello, testing, testing, one, two, three. My name's Clint, and I'll be in all the news. And then when I played, when, it, when I heard it back, it's like, oh, fucking okay, hell, what is that noise? Well, it's like that, and it's me talking. So I always... I was always a bit embarrassed about my voice growing up and I'm from Oldham, so that, that don't help, you know, having an Oldham accent. Uh, so I, I was never, I never dreamed that I'd end up in a job where I, I use my voice on, on the, the, on the radio. I think with singing, it's a bit different because, you know, when you sing, you, you almost take on a different tone anyway, don't you? You know, I think just by nature, people don't really sing in their own voice. You, you become something else, but talking, it's like, there was no escaping the fact that I sounded a bit of a, you know, a bit of a, no bad, really. And then, um, but the more I did interviews with the Inspirals and heard myself talk, and I sort of came to terms that that's, you know, that's how it is, and you can't really do anything about it. And then in um, the Clint Boone experience stopped around two, early 2000. Um, in fact, before that, yeah, when the Inspirals stopped in 95, I started getting asked then to do little little radio um, broadcasts. So they used to call it an RSL. We'd yes. have like community station that was in a one month trial broadcast or whatever yeah um and sometimes we were trying to get a license to broadcast full time or sometimes it'd just be a charitable thing so i started getting calls saying do you want to do um you know we're doing a little radio broadcast in the oxfam shop in manchester for a month do you fancy coming doing a show and at that point it was me like yeah because i just play loads of my favorite records and, and talk about why i love them you know without trying to be a radio presenter you know this is uh this is, uh, you know, Linton Quezzy Johnson and a track that I really love and this is what I love about it. Bang, put it on. And then that'll finish. Right, I'm going to play something from Elvis Presley. And it was just me being an enthusiastic music fan on these little radio uh, stations. So that I did quite a bit of that. And then I started getting asked to do uh, stand-in for Terry Christian. It was on a, a station down here called Century. 
and this would be right in early two thousand, like two thousand, two thousand one, and it was uh, quite a, a much loved show. They did an evening show, um, probably similar to the slot Mark Riley's got now on yeah. stick. But we play a lot of Northern Soul and you know punk and all that, and I started getting the the standing gig for that. So it got my taste up a little bit, my skill, you know, obviously improved. And then in 2003, when the Inspirals were back together, we went to Six Music in London and did um, an interview with Tom Robinson. We might have done a session, but I know I did an interview. I was chatting with him. And then at the end of the interview, Tom said, you sound really good on the radio. And I said, I've been doing a little bit. You know, I'm not been, I'm not looking at changing my profession, but I've been doing a bit of radio. And he said, well, I'm, I'm going away in August for two weeks. How do you fancy standing in for me on Six? Right, which sounds amazing now, doesn't it? But at the time, six wasn't a, it, it wasn't such a big thing back then. Six music, yeah. Um, and subsequently, they tried shutting it down, didn't they? If you remember, not not because of me, but anyway, so I, did, I did two weeks in London for Tom Robinson's show. Me and my wife, they put us up in the hotel next to the BBC. We actually conceived our son Oscar while we were down there. So he's a six music baby, <laughs> which is amazing. Isn't it? He was like. It, it, one of the great things that came out of working for six is Oscar Boone, and he's now a bass player. He's just started music college. Well, wow. um, but yeah, so suddenly my CV looked quite good because I'd done this tour of Christian stuff. I'd done six music, um, and the, the offers I was getting on radio then sort of started getting a little bit better and a little bit better. And then eventually, um, I had a great relationship with the XFM in London because when I had the Clint Boone experience, they were always playing my records. They were really supportive, and back then the PRS that I got for being played on a London only station, the PRS was massive. Right. So financially they bailed me out. Every time they played my song, I think it was like 120 quid every time they played my record. Really? And, <laughs> oh, like, and so I, I had a great relationship with them, obviously. I fucking loved them. But um, <laughs> but then we started doing things like they'd have me doing the, the London traffic from my house in Rochdale. I'd be on the phone. They'd tell me during the record what the traffic was doing. London Bridge is busy on you know eastbound of it. And I'd I'd, I'd do the I'd do the uh, the traffic news, and it was all like a laugh, and you know, yeah. But that's how how close we were at me and XFM London. They didn't have a Manchester station back then. And then in uh, what year were we? Two, towards the end of two thousand and three, I think it was two thousand and four, probably two thousand and four. I got a call from a mate of mine in London who just had a meeting at XFM, and he said your name's just come up because they want to try and get a license to broadcast in Manchester. Are you interested in getting involved? I said definitely. So anyway, I had the conversation. They said. They wanted me to help to get they're helping the bid to win the license because you don't just get a license you've got to yeah. put your bid against nine or ten other companies that are trying to get the same license so i joined up with xfm to you know try and get that license we spent a year of campaigning and putting events on and uh, they got it they got the gig and, and you know subsequently i got five days a week and for the rest of my life it feels like <laughs> if XFM turned into radio x and then you know, I've now moved over to XS Manchester, which is still part of the same family, you know, in a funny sort of way. So, yeah, me getting onto radio wasn't ever a plan. Um, and it wasn't ever a desire, really. It's just something that happened accidentally. And, you know, in a lot of ways, it's, it's saved my life in terms of the stability it's given me to build, you know, the, the family I've got and the house I've got. And it's, you know, I, I yeah. love that stability because in, in a band, you don't always have that. It's quite volatile, you know what I mean, in terms of... You know what I'm saying? Anyway, it's, it's the closest thing I've had to a proper job. This and it it does it does feel nice, but it has taken me away from being creative because it sort of consumed a lot of my time. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I, obviously, I knew I was interviewing you. I've done a lot of sort of research online and stuff. You've you've done a lot of interviews. You've interviewed some big names that like you see your friend Paul Weller, um, loads of other artists as well. But there, there's one interview that I come across, and I remember seeing this live, and I want I want to get your opinion on it. It was for T4 with uh, Steve Jones, and you were on with Ian Brown, and they were talking randomly about martial arts. I think you'd said, "Oh, it'd be kung fu," and Ian Brown's reply was, "He would do some Brazilian dance martial art." And I think the, the interview got cut because Ian Brown ended up having a square go with Steve Jones. That must have been a bit awkward for you that day, mate, was it not? <laughs> it was a bit. I mean, because it was um, it was a long day for me. I, I was DJing that night at a Carling 24 event in London. Yeah. So it was a 24-hour event, loads of different venues. And I think Ian's gig was, he was like the headline act, but he was going to be playing at midnight, like, you know, Shepherd's Bush Empire or whatever it was. So... There was no plan to do that interview together. I just got a call um, on the morning saying, how do you fancy doing an interview with you and Ian Brown for T4? 
And I said, well, if he's up for it, I'll do it. But it's, I'm, I'm going to have to set up soon to get down there in time. I was driving down. I had my wife and my baby at the time, Oscar, who was a toddler by then. So they said, yeah, Ian's up for it. I said, right, I'll get down. They wanted us in London for tea time. So we got in this little Volkswagen that we had and we legged it to London. Sorry, was it Volkswagen? Can't remember. Legged it to London. Um, no, it's a Fiesta, I think. <laughs> got to London, just got to the TV studio in time. Um, and Ian turned up. I think Ian had flown in from Mexico. And he, he wasn't feeling great. You know, he was jet lagged. He was under the weather. Um, anyway, we started this interview. And I think, from what I can remember, it started off nicely. But then when it came to the martial art, because he, he, Ian is a fan of this uh, this particular martial art, martial art, and I think Steve said to him, "Shows what you mean." Um, and I, I, if I remember rightly, Ian said, "Like stop it, shut up, whatever." And I think what should have happened there, Steve Jones should have just changed the subject. Well, he started pushing, didn't he, for Ian to demonstrate? I, I, I think he actually interrupted Ian at the start and kind of cut him off midway through, That's explaining cool. what the martial art was. And yeah. I think that maybe hit a nerve with him. And, yeah, uh, he, I'm talking. He shot him. Talking. He did that, didn't he? But then when he carried on, and then Steve Jones said, um, you know, give us a demonstration. And then Ian said, do you want me to knock you out from over here? Do you want me to come over there and do it? So it was a bit, I think it was, I think Steve probably should have known to just stop because it's Ian Brown. And Ian, there's some pop stars that you know they don't suffer fools, you know what I mean? And I think Ian's one of them. Um, and I, I just think he just got out of hand. I think it was Ian being under the weather, jet lag, you know, banging into Steve's uh, kiddiness. I mean, in, in what way? Steve was being very professional. He was trying to get the, the guy to entertain. He was trying to get content, as we call it. I wonder, you know what I mean? So, but yeah, it was just a clash, a bit, a bit of a clash. And I'm just, I'm just sat there thinking, I've come all this way. My kids over there, my wife's there, and. and it's probably not even going to get shown this. You know what I mean? I just thought it was a wasted trip. Anyway, they showed it that night on um, T4 or Channel 4, whatever it was. And they did show it because we saw it. I think we were in the hotel after I'd done my DJ gig and we, we saw it. But they'd left a little bit more on the end of it that you don't see on the current YouTube one, where it is, it's them two having a go. And then I just said to Ian, Ian, come on, chill out. And he says to me, Clint, I'm the king of chill. You know that. And that's not on the YouTube one. I wish it was. Uh, no, they've cut that about. <laughs> yeah, I'm the king of chilling, you know that. But, um, yeah, I, I, you know, it's, it's up there. It's just, I think it's, I think people are a bit harsh on Steve Jones about it. You know what I mean? Because um, it was just him just trying to be a great presenter, wasn't it? And, well, I, I wouldn't have done it. I didn't know meant to shut up and change the subject. <laughs> yeah, move on, move on. Uh, one other thing I found out online, and I don't know if this was a throwaway comment that you done, Clint, but is there talk of a, a film maybe on the horizon? Very much so, yeah. It's one of my big... Not a, not even a passion project. It started off as that, but I've been on it for nine years now. Um, I'll give you a little brief background. Basically, it's called Bickershaw, and it's based around an actual real-life music festival that happened near Wigan in 1972 in a village called Bickershaw mining village it was a coal mining village and bearing in mind in 1972 the big festivals that had been on you had Woodstock out in uh, near New York uh, the Isle of Wight festival had happened on mainland Britain there was no real big festivals happening yet you know Glastonbury had had the first year but not not a big event so bearing in mind that this this was a little mining town in a village in near Wigan and it attracted like 50 60 thousand people the acts were the grateful dead country joe and the fish donovan the kinks massive bands that pe performed people came from all over the country to it once they heard what was going on and it was a mud bath all the fences were down health and safety had not been heard of and it was just you know in real life it was just um outrageous that this thing actually did happen so our story is built around that it's a, it's a family but it's a story about a family that get involved with the festival and everything looks like it's going to tits up and it, it will have a feel good ending by the time we finish it. But, but the script, we've been developing the script for nine years. The, the final version is just about written. We've had a producer on board for five years. who has been helping us to fine tune it. And, and he's, he, his last big gig was he worked on England is mine. He was the co-producer on that. Right. So very much a serious producer who knows the industry. And he's just waiting for that script to be finished now. And then he can take it out into the world and get the finance. That we need. We've got a script editor called Tracy Ann Baines who's again helping us to understand um, 
the beats of writing a film you know the, the it's like making a record it's you know there's the technique yeah. that you use of you know tried and tested over centuries so we've got tracy on board again very professional big name she's worked, she works on doctor who regularly and you know some of the big tv shows so that's that's the, the the background of it um but then about five years ago we decided to make it a musical hey. so i'm now i've written all the songs for it 15 14 or 15 songs for it i'm playing the part of billy fielding who's pretty much the main character he's the shopkeeper so he's billy fielding that's the part i'm you know destined to play the yeah. songs are written and the next bit is we're going to start taking it out into the world and seeing if people are excited about it and i think people go mad for it because of the the you know the the subplots that are in there there's a lot of things you can relate to in the modern day with this you know the um the, the massive monster coming to town as we call it this this invasion um which until a year ago we're thinking oh that really you know that, that really equates to brexit that doesn't it and all this but now it's like the pandemic yeah that, that's the fucking monster that's messed all our lives up but there's like resentment when um when the festival starts to arrive a lot of the people in the mining village don't want it some yeah. do so it's all that conflict, you know, within the family, within the community. So it's all, um, it's, it's it's exciting to think that all the things I've told you about already that I'm excited about, like the Patreon and other things. It's like, this is something on the back burner that people don't really know about yet. But yeah. I think once we, once we push the button on that, that could just take me off in a completely different direction where everything else might have to go out the window for a bit, you know. <laughs> no, Bill, I wish you every success with that. I look forward yeah. to hopefully seeing that on the big screen one day. Um, yeah. Should be good, mate. Final yeah. question for you, Clint. I appreciate your time, and I'm sure you've run out of beer. You need to get a top up. <laughs> um, well, it's not, you know what? I bet any minute now, my wife will probably come back down. <laughs> like that, she really looks after me. <laughs> if you, yeah, but like we've touched on, you've been on top of the pops. You've been on Chris Evans's TFI Friday. Sold out constant amount of festivals, gigs, etc. Had highs, had lows. If there was a genie that could get you to rub a lamp and you could go back to to one day in the past, relive it, the full 24 hours, what would you do again, mate? Good question, that, but I think probably the day I saw the Sex Pistols, I'd document that day more fully because I've always been into photography. And, you know, back it back to the early 70s. In fact, when I was a kid, I was in the lo local camera club in Shaw, Oldham. <laughs> but um, I've got photographs going back to, you know, back to fucking the 60s and 70s or whatever. But that day, to say that I was at art college and I was doing, you know, my main thing was photography. And I didn't take a camera with me that night. And we all knew it was an exciting thing that we were going to go to. But why did I not take a camera? Probably because our cameras were all big fucking shin-ons or whatever they were. These <laughs> um, but I didn't take a camera. To, and I just wish, yeah, if, that day, if I could have documented it from, from the day. Because we went straight from art college. We were at art college for the day. We all put our uniforms on, which were like black. We used to buy black um, old men's evening suits from Oxfam. Right. We painted the collars white. And the, the pocket flaps white, um, and then you know, like the stripe down the side of the pants, and so we, and then we'd have a big splash of white paint down the back of our jacket. That was our, our look, you know what I mean? And we used to all walk around like that, and that's how we went to the, the pistols that night. Um, and to, to imagine us like in the afternoon getting excited about going to this gig down down in the city and putting our suits on and walking in and seeing it all, do you know what I mean? And then you know, just realizing that this is everything's changing. This is my, this, this like as important as the day I was born, really. So yeah. I think I, I would have liked to have documented that day a bit better. I'll tell you what I did do. I actually ripped a piece of uh, vinyl off one, one of the stools in the venue yeah. because I remember thinking this, this is magical. What's happening now is important. I need to get a souvenir. And I, I just found a, a bit of red plastic hanging off this stool. I pulled it off and I still got it. Just a little bit of red vinyl. I bet that's my beer being delivered, is it? I don't know if it's fun. Yeah, yeah um, I wouldn't need that. I'll be right with you. Right, yeah. <laughs> I'm nearly done now. Um, yeah, he needs to borrow my phone. He's doing some filming, and he needs to borrow my phone as well as this. So, but yeah, <laughs> I'd probably document that day, the 9th of December, Thursday, 9th of December, 1976. I'd go back go. to that day, I think, and do that again, and maybe go backstage and try and talk to some of them. You know what I mean? <laughs> I John Lydon. I to John Lydon about a year ago for uh, XS Manchester, and that was an eye point in my life. That because knowing the what impact. You know, punk the punk scene had on my life and the repercussions of it to this absolute to, to today. Yeah. You know that little lad who just stuck his head around the door. He's been homeschooled for eight years, um, and that's because it's like that punk ethic. We can do this ourselves. We can do this better than the, the machine. You know what I mean? That's what made us decide to try it. And he's now at uh, music college. He's an amazing bass player, 
and oh, he's yeah. a genius in his sciences as well. He does. So it's like homeschooling does work. So what I'm saying is, if I hadn't seen the Sex Pistols that night, I probably wouldn't have ended up getting into homeschooling. You know what I mean? So, yeah, a big, big, big moment for me that. And, and to get to interview John all them years later, John Lydon, and tell him you changed my life and him appreciate it. And when it, when I told him I was in the Inspirers, he's like, oh, I remember you lot. You were great. You were really great. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, Cl- right, it was good to talk to you. Likewise, it's been an absolute pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Clint Boone. Nice one, guys. See you in a bit, yeah?